the next speakers um, from Deutsche Telekom, Julia Leihner and Thomas Veltzel, uh, they're going to have an interesting point of view because um, I think out of all the speakers, they're really the ones coming from you know, an internal corporation, like you know, corporate um, a point of view because um, it's, it's Deutsche Telekom and, and they have their internal design agency. So yeah, welcome, Julia and Thomas. Yours. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Yasmina. I'm glad to be here today and to give you a perspective from internally and how we, as the, the Deutsche Telekom, um, are actively living the service design approach. And not only us, um, as the Creation Center, which I have found it with a couple of other members around five years ago, but also um, from the perspective of one of our clients. Hey, I'm Thomas Welzel. Um, I'm Proposition Manager in Deutsche Telekom for um, Core Telco Products. Um, and we've done a number of projects together with the Creation Center here in Berlin um, to find out what really the customer wants. And interestingly, we are part of this entertainment session today. Uh, and uh, the project that we're going to introduce as a case study is ex exactly the opposite. It's a non-entertainment product. It is uh, leave me alone. I'm fed up with all the stuff that's going on, and I need to rest. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about in this case study. And I actually hope that we will be entertaining nevertheless. <laughs> OK, one question I brought with you. Um, have you ever come closer than you ever wanted to get in some case? So for example, when you're knocking at a door and you're entering into a private situation and you don't really know what's going on, or maybe you've picked up someone's phone to check the time, and then you actually see a message popping in which you better didn't want to read. Or you've been in the train in some situation where you had to listen to someone else's conversation and you really didn't want to really hear it. Have you ever had these kind of situations? Yes, I see some nods somewhere in the audience. Well, I tell you, service design is a very, very powerful tool. And we would also like to show you today how we have stepped sometimes into so-called unwanted findings or unexpected findings. And I've brought one little video clip with us today where we really yeah, did some user research, asked the users some questions. And with the powerful tool of video, uh, video ethnography, we were able to capture some things which yeah, we didn't really expect. So let's have a look at this little video. This was a text message we sent out to the consumers and got some film uh, footage back. Sitzen. Sitzen. Um, we're at the Historische Hafen Berlin. And I just had a little beer, and now I'm going home with the doggies. Um, I have to think about what I don't want to <laughs> show my friends. I think about it. Now the question was showing something which she didn't really want to show us or my um, show not her friends at this moment. Although I'm also not ashamed about it. And this is what you sometimes get. So obviously, you don't, we didn't really expect um, you know, this kind of an honest and really open approach when we um, approached her as one of our customers for our user research. And this was an interesting finding for us to see really how far this method can go and how close you can actually get to people. And if we click one further, we will also see that during this project, we have stepped into fields which we didn't really expect uh, from the start. What we actually discovered is we discovered a finding that is somewhat disrupting, disruptive for a Deutsche Telekom. And it really kind of reveals something which yeah, was a big question mark for quite a few of our um, managers when we showed our findings. Um, and how a disruptive user research yeah, can happen. We would like to share in this best practice example, which we brought along with us. And that's one of the projects we did together with Thomas. Um, and it's yeah, going to show a, a slide in a little bit. Yeah, there you can see 
one of our findings. Yeah. And this is the slide I would love to have. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So design research, on one hand, reveals findings you didn't want to see. And then it also reveals you know, moments uh, our customers go through, which, as a Deutsche Telekom, are not really pleasing to find. And how this all uh, happened, we're going to share now with our best practice example. And uh, this is when Thomas approached us with a certain brief. And I'm going to hand over. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the question was very, very simple. Um, what is presence on a mobile phone? So we all know presence from different services on the internet. Um, there were, in the old days, there were these instant messengers like Yahoo, MSN, um, and uh, then Facebook has adopted to that slightly. There is different services providing different presence. But what is presence on a mobile phone? That was actually the question that we were about to evaluate with customers in co-creation sessions. And we went through a very long process that we introduced here. And then when uh, Thomas approached us uh, with this request, we said, OK, the first step um, of a service design journey is actually set up the team. So on one hand, we have the users, obviously, the, um, as we call them, ITAX experten. So that also includes you, everyone moves using a mobile phone. And when we look out for users, we're obviously look, looking out for extreme users who have extreme habits. And then on the other hand, we obviously have the product manager directly on board of our services and product, like Thomas and his colleagues. And that was pretty much the P&I division of the Deutsche Telekom. You want to add a couple of words to that, maybe? Uh, P&I um, stands for Products and Innovation in Deutsche Telekom. And, and it's, a, it's a unit um, as part of the headquarters where we um, develop and implement new services, um, improve the existing services, and, and try to match all products as good as possible with the customer expectations. That's what we're there for. And then there's the creation center, basically. And uh, yeah, as you can see on the top corner, it's not only us. It's also with the support of some freelancers, um, of even some excellent agencies like Standby, like Spur. We've heard of them today, even like IXDS, which we've seen pre presenting um, before. And uh, just to give you a bit of a clue what we do at the Creation Center, we are a very small team. We're four core members, and we have uh, an interdisciplinary setup, designers as well as market researchers as well as engineers. And we have interns from all over the world having a vibrant, lively team. Very small, but very powerful. And here we have a small movie clip uh, showing you a bit the, the approach, how we actually started from the technology background and then really opening up and using the user world as an inspirational source. Back in 2008, telecom was advancing in technology. Knowledge of users was restricted to spreadsheets. There was lots of ideas, but there was no space for the ideas. The Creation Center lets you form observations, ask questions, run with thoughts. In fact, we take your mind on a journey. We give you the flexibility to scratch below the surface and deep dive, to observe from the grand scale and inspect from the cellular level, getting inside the minds of your users and see what they see. In order to generate even more great ideas, and that's how the Creation Center journey can save you time and money and increase the quality of your product in a fun way. Thank you. So we really kind of, you know, get in the mind of our users and really go out there, you know, and travel as a travel agency almost to the consumer to really, you know, go in everyday life and get inspired um, and then really deep dive uh, and kind of identify the needs of the customers and then also get the perspective from above and really kind of you know, go into people's homes and ask what this all is about and really observe them. And I think that's what we help management to do. And we really kind of you know, bring them from that ivory tower of the Deutsche Telekom really to the grounds of you know, homes out there and do this in a very fun and creative process in a very fun lab, as you can tell. It's not really looking like normal telecom offices. And uh, this is a very, um, yeah. I think, well-working setup. Um, and I think, if you click one further, we also uh, kind of having the role of bridging the gap between technology um, on one hand, the research divisions, and the business on the other hand. 
We as well have the role of being um, kind of, um, you know, people bringing a new mindset into the company and really kind of making culture change happen. And at the end of the day, we are a platform, as we can now see the slide coming up. Yes, perfect, it's here again. Um, and we're really a platform um, where we bring different people from different backgrounds together. So on one hand, the users, on one hand, the product management, experts from different fields, people from technology, and us as facilitators to really you know, make things happen and make people kind of approach innovation from different perspectives. And I've actually mentioned that, and I'm going to jump further to actually now our approach. So we've boiled down the service design approach to four main steps. Research, analysis, ideation, and concepting. And I think we've heard a lot about this today, so I'm not going to go into depth. But what I want to mention is that this process helps us to one hand open up, to really kind of you know, go wild, go crazy, but then focus again at a certain point. And then this, uh, the sec second step as well, um, you know, um, prepare or really kind of um, you know, approach this, this, this mechanism on an iterative basis to really kind of go back and forth as the questions come up and not be afraid to go a step back. It's really not a linear process we're running through here. And this is extremely important to go through an iteration. And once you think you now found it, you, you now found the basic need that you've identified, you need to test it, and then you'll learn what works and what doesn't work. And normally 50% of what you really thought is, is well funded and you can prove it with all the, the data, then it fails in the way you're actually presenting it to the end consumer. And you then have to restart from somewhere in the middle of the process and take it through again. But that's not, that's not dumb failure, that's smart failure in improving the quality of your findings, in, in improving the quality of your prototype product, um, and improving the customer experience of the overall perception of the end consumer. And uh, for this project we would like to show you, this was you know, the process we ran through. We're going to only touch on a couple of the process steps, and due to time, obviously. And so the first step, obviously, was the consumer research. And we already heard something about cultural probes. We very much believe in this method to um, give the consumers time to reflect themselves and give us a probe of their cultural kind of uh, habits. And uh, one tool we love to use is um, the little flip cam, which you can see up there in the image. And that helps us to really capture these videos, these really kind of raw materials out of people's lives. Um, and then after. Um, you know, getting really interesting material back and even highlighting aspects, for example, with these little hearts you see up there. Um, we then um, really go back to the offices and then um, review these uh, images after also sat down, having sat down with the customers to ask a couple more questions to really get in-depth insights. And then when we come back to the creation center, we all together, you know, look at the videos, and then we have on one hand inspiration, but on the other hand, we have proof of concept, and we can pull out these videos anytime throughout the whole process, as it was mentioned before. So um, one of the important findings uh, after this analysis process was that we said, okay, um, yeah, there are a couple of opportunity fields for us in there, and it's on one hand, me time, my inner circle, people I know. And the one insight I would love to focus on is free up me time. So that's an insight which came from a, from a couple of users and say, they said, I need to disconnect from time to time. So what kind of a news is that for a company like the Deutsche Telekom? Do you see an opportunity there for us? So if you want to go one step further, I mean, if you think about that people are actually urging for that Funkloch, that hole where they're disconnected, where they can breathe, where they you know, completely have uh, uh, no connection whatsoever, is that an opportunity for the Deutsche Telekom? That's your ask yourself. And this is actually the unwanted kind of finding we found, and then we said, well, let's put our brains together and think of a solution with our creative tools, with our ideation process. And we went wild, and we went crazy, even the, even the managers, as you can see in the pictures. And if you go one step further, you see uh, one of our favorite tools, which is the idea napkin. You know, when you sketch out ideas in hotels, you know that it's really quick and drafty, and it really helps to boil an idea down to what it actually is. And if I go one step further, it's really about working with that so-called me time and say, OK, why don't we offer a service while people are off, while people are actually kind of enjoying themselves and having a break? So, you know, what if, you know, we had something really in that moment where everything is too much and I cut off, and now I think 
Yeah. Behind that service, there is an approach we can present to you now. So, so this, I'm always on, I can reach wherever I am, anybody can get through to me at any time, is a concept that people don't like. That was the basic findings, and then we dig deeper into the different use cases, and we brought three use cases to introduce. So um, the first one is you're sitting in a meeting and you're expecting a really important call and you say that to your uh, um, colleague and, and people accept that normally if you give them a good reason, but um, they will urge you to make sure that only this important call will disturb the meeting and not any other call. So you can prioritize by caller. That was something where our customers um, showed some interest in. Um, second one, your boss always calls you over the weekend and tries to brief you uh, what needs to be done next week or, or whatever reason. And this one works the other way around as well. We had um, uh, participants in our research uh, sessions um, saying, um, my boss doesn't want uh, me to make private calls during working hours. Um, so it would be great if my phone could filter that, that out and leave me a message and then I can recollect, and this was very important, um, recollect after I'm on again and have a good overview what happened in all my different channels and then I decide where to get back to and not the others when to disturb me. So that was really important to our customers. Leave me alone. I don't want to be uh, uh, making phone calls or receiving phone calls at that point in time or emails or messages or Facebook whatsoever. That was the really important thing. So the service uh, journey was all about setting something up, and this must be really straightforward and simple. Um, it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to try and get customers um, in lengthy setup sessions and declare who is in which group, and so on. The, so, so we had some self-adaptive uh, uh, mechanisms built into our prototype. Then the phase, uh, when you're actually in the me time mode, so you're in the opera, in the cinema, in the church, for instance, where you don't want to be disturbed, and then leave the me time mode and get all the um, information of what uh, um, has happened in the meanwhile while you were off. So and obviously, we yeah, after, after setting up a concept like this, it's obviously really important to test it again and again. So we went out, invited some users, and did some paper prototypes, did some mock-ups in Germany as well as in the UK to really get some feedback and iterate on our suggestions. Yeah, and we built um, actually a prototype working on an Android device. Um, so there were different uh, mechanisms that we used on the device, like calendar, like um, the location, connection to certain access points to determine whether you're in the car or outside the car, to determine your current availability for communication. Um, these are actual screenshots of our MeTime prototype implementation that we've then tested um, in the field with a number of uh, consumers. Oops. Um, and um, so, so it could de determine um, based on a number of factors in which mode you're currently in, and the device could learn whenever you're available for a certain type of communication. Then we did the trial, a field trial, six weeks, uh, 50 handsets in, in the field, and uh, let people walk away with uh, um, our ideas and report on a regular basis. We had some online forms where people uh, could get back to us and say, this is what works with me, or if problems here, or questions, and whatsoever. And that really worked out well. Um, and for instance, we found out, we had a great idea, and we thought it's really cool, um, whenever the customer um, is in case of doubt whether he's uh, um, available for a call or not. We built an option that said, okay, I'm fairly busy at this time, uh, but uh, if it's really urgent, you can press seven on your screen and we try to um, terminate the call at the, at the customer, otherwise leave a message um, and I can get back to you as soon as possible. And this was a great idea, what we thought, but it never worked out. Why didn't it work out? Um, your real friends don't try to disturb you when you indicate that you're not available and that it's not really a, a good situation you're in, but the guy who's trying to sell you a carpet will press the seven and get through to you. So, so there is a mismatch of expectations and, and motivation for that, for that call. Okay, so in the implementation, um, what we have determined wasn't really a product for a network operator. That became clear um, in the early phase uh, of the project already. Um, however, we have put that into um, our uh, terminal requirements that we hand over to app developers and to handset manufacturers. 
Um, so they have started to build things in that determine availability and, and um, have the customer available for, for calls and messages or not, or have automatic answers on, in certain situations. So at the end of the day, it's really all about the mindset and also really kind of thinking out of the box and maybe thinking also sometimes off your kind of normal revenue streams. And even if you discover something sometimes unwanted, to even you know, be brave enough and say, okay, let's explore what's behind it and let's see what we can really do for our customers. Because even you know, if, it's, if it's an idea or a concept which is not 100% applicable for the Deutsche Telekom, it's still a very crucial aspect for people continuously using networks which we're providing. So it's also in our interest to you know, make even you know, our partners work in the right direction. And if you go one further, I think it's really um, you know, uh, very important to, to even start innovation with so-called unwanted findings. And the clue or the, 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 the kind of, you know, uh, the challenge is to really make these unwanted findings actually into wanted findings. And really, you know, uh, take, you know, the whole story the other way around and, and, and see what you can actually do with even unpleasant things and take this as a boost for innovation. Um, yes, and move forward. Okay. Um, so what, what we've done, we've taken customer co-creation to actually uh, um, have a leap in our innovation curve, and that worked pretty well. And this is the one learning that we try to convey to you guys, uh, um, and to, to have something to take away uh, with you and take it home. And the other learning is, if including videos into, into presentations is great, but it never works out. <laughs> it's a lot better for the user <laughs> research, especially. Thank you very much. We're happy for your feedback. Thank you very much, Julia and Thomas. So, any now questions? Back to the crowd, any questions? I don't actually see anyone. I would like to know how you would sell this insight to stakeholders internally. So, what type of uh, business case would you make for this type of product, especially as? Um, yeah, you hinted at some things there, but I didn't really get it. How we sold the insights internally? Yeah, okay. we heard a lot about uh, business models and stuff, and this sort of came up as... Um, well, the, I, I guess the, your question is about the business case of this product? Yeah, how is would you sell this internally? <laughs> because it runs kind of counter your real business model, so how did you push this forward? Because it's... Yes expensive to run these types of studies? No, it's not necessarily expensive. So th th there is two things that um, determine the business case. One thing is you raise customer satisfaction by better serving customer needs, and that's always a good thing to have. So, so that, but that's a fairly generic answer, and, and all your finance departments don't give a shit on that uh, argument. But there is a second one. It's inducing communication, and uh, because um, a call that um, is just pressed away because it disturbs you, always um, gets you a negative feeling. So please don't disturb me. I don't have the time right now, and I don't want this call. So that's always negative. But when I'm stepping out of the cinema again, and I see that you called me to try and, and ask about the business case of this function, then I've got the time, and then we can have a lengthy conversation. And the inbound call that you dropped to me is converted into an outbound call that I dropped to you. And outbound calls are valuable for us. And, and there is other examples as well. Think about in a car, when you're in a car um, and somebody um, sends you a text message and gets an information that you're not driving in a car, so you can't read and answer text messages, but you're available for a voice call if, if he wants, then you can discuss the same issue on, uh, on, the, on the phone. And that's, again, inducing new business. But Basically, whatever you do that the customer wants makes your service better and brings success in one or the other way. We're very much convinced of that. Okay? Maybe one question from my side to the audience. Have any one of you experienced that so-called digital hangover where you actually had enough and where you did want to also disconnect? Hands up. Do you know this problem? So I think that's already a proof of concept that is really worth taking this journey and you know, showing the proof of concept even to our managers who didn't want to believe that 
from first sight, and I think it's, it's really important to make people aware of you know, these developments and think of how you can actually still create a good service and have happy customers at the end of the day. And I think that's what we try to do. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks again.